Welcome to Hidden Conversations. Hidden Conversations is coordinated by WVIK and hosted by Dr. Ladrina Wilson, a leadership and diversity expert and founder of Iman Consulting. These conversations are designed to delve into many of the most difficult issues of race and equity facing the Quad Cities today. Many of these issues we hear about every day on the national news, but then are left unaware when they occur to our own friends and neighbors. We hope that by hearing firsthand stories and statistics from experts based right here in the Quad Cities, we can break down the myth that these things only happen somewhere else, and in so doing, increase our empathy for those who literally live right next door. Thank you for joining us this evening. Here's Dr. Ladrina Wilson. Good evening. I'm so happy to have another opportunity to come uh, together with some of the Quad Cities finest. And today we are talking about Black entrepreneurship. I wanted to just share with you um, a little insight about why this topic came to be, why we're having this particular conversation today, and hopefully what you can take away from some of the dialogue that we have with today's panelists. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity with some uh, local community members um, and community leaders to travel to um, Raleigh-Durham in North Carolina for a program called Forward Cities. And as part of that program, we toured uh, Durham uh, to find out more about equity issues. So the, the program Forward Cities was formerly CEOs for Cities and they merged and created this kind of cohort experience and professional development experience around economic equity. So with that, we toured uh, Durham and we found out about Black Wall Street that was in Durham. And I can remember walking away from that conversation with one of our local CEOs and, and her heart was kind of breaking and aching about um, learning about what had happened to Black Wall Street in Durham. And in that experience, she saw and learned about a community that was uh, bustling and thriving where there were black owned banks and black owned grocery stores, black owned hospitals and black run hospitals, so on and so forth. And um, that was around the late 1800s, the early 1900s before uh, highways were built. And I could go on and on about gentrification and what happens when um, developers are not intentional about uh, how they approach uh, economic growth. But in all that, I share the story to say this. She walked away and said, what would have happened if we would have considered, if the community would have considered how to maintain and ensure that these Black communities had what they needed to thrive, had their own resources, um, certainly knowing that at that particular time, resources were available based on colors, right? Based on color. Um, and now we don't as much have uh, that in terms of outright discrimination, but certainly having your own source of income, um, having your sense of community, having something that you can pass down generation to generation uh, would be important to our overall economic well being in our community. And in that, story and, and learning, I shared with her this. There are many instances throughout history that we don't hear about where there have been Black successes in the form of entrepreneurship that have been decimated and destroyed um, in very intentional ways. And if we aren't careful, we recreate some of that if we don't bring that same level of intentionality to supporting Black-owned businesses. Um, you may have heard of the Tulsa massacre, um, what happened in Durham for that Black Wall Street was not a massacre. There were not necessarily uh, businesses and people that were targeted and killed, but it certainly massacred their economy. And so I want you to think about that. I want you to think about places like Rosewood, Florida, where there was a Black Str Wall Street with thriving businesses, a thriving Black economy. And when those communities excel, so does the rest of the community. We all grow and thrive when all members of our community are allowed access to economic prosperity. So I share that history in a national context to be able to contextualize why this conversation at the local level is so important. We have many black owned businesses uh, and black run operations here in our community that we um, need to be intentional about supporting. There are some 
organizations that we all have our struggles, particularly in COVID um, times, I would say, uh, but there are some unique challenges that are presented in Black entrepreneurship. And today's guests are going to share some of those rewarding experiences, but also some of those unique challenges that come with being a Black-owned business. Um, they're also going to share their insights with us about why this conversation may or may not be relevant uh, from their perspective. And so I'd like to invite in our guest for today. We have Larry Westbrook Jr. from Fresh Start Cleaning Service. Hello, Larry. And we have Danette Moritis. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, uh, from, the, from the taste of Ethiopia. And I will just tell you, having experienced both of these businesses firsthand, you are missing out if you are not working with them. But I will, uh, I will leave that up to them to kind of tell their story. Uh, first off, I just want to start off. Maybe we'll start with you, Larry, and get a little insight uh, from you. I want to know if you're, you know, if you're willing to share with us a little bit about your business, the services that you offer, and what inspired you to open your own business. Sure. Um, so <clears throat> we started um, Fresh Start Cleaning about four years ago, and we, we as in me in this very moment, <laughs> um, had, you know, it, it was never one of my dreams, I guess, to have a cleaning company. Um, I knew that I would I would do something for myself. And, um, you know, I guess you could say by skill, I'm a singer. Um, and so that was, I was more in the music field um, doing things while working at John Deere as well. Um, but I had the opportunity to work with uh, one of my friends over the summer, uh, the summers where I was laid off. Um, I had the opportunity to work with her cleaning company um, as the marketing director and then uh, move from there to the operations manager. And so I kind of learned a lot about um, uh, standardizing, you know, uh, some of the, the cleaning process and, and just that whole thing. Um, coming from a household where, you know, I've been cleaning since I was like four years old. Um, <laughs> It was it, it, the cleaning part of it was not, you know, it, it wasn't far from me, but um, the business side of it was very intriguing and it was, though it was stressful, I had a lot of fun. Um, well, through some unfortunate situations, um, I was kind of left with the opportunity to um, start my own or take over the, the company that I was uh, working with. And so I decided to start my own. And initially what I did, because they were residential, um, what I decided was to go commercial because, you know, I didn't want to be, you know, a, a rival, I guess, so to speak, uh, with one of my friends. And so uh, we started commercial and uh, we did pretty well. But some of the people that I had cleaned for, some of the homes that I cleaned for, um, got wind that <laughs> I was no longer with them and they came with me. Um, and it was by word of mouth that we grew on the residential side. And then, uh, you know, kind of out of nowhere, the commercial side just took off. And so we are now probably about 90% commercial. Um, 10% residential, but we do, um, our services are move out, move in, move out, which is one of our larger uh, services. Um, we service a lot of the apartment complexes here in the Quad Cities. Um, and then we do, of course, residential and commercial. Um, and we also do post-construction. That was something that we had ended up getting into uh, because there were so many businesses that were opening right before COVID. And um, so we were able to jump in on that. And uh, there's a housing program that, um, a housing project in Rock Island that started, they started building these homes and, and we were the ones that they chose for that bid. So we have been doing a lot of post-construction uh, post um, sites. And I think what inspired me really was, um, I had the opportunity to experience and you know growing up our house was never dirty you know um can i just can i just stop you for a second sure. can I do we to be some transparency in this <laughs> so Gannett, you maybe yeah. don't know this but larry and i are relatives 
Okay. Oh, so, didn't know that. No, so he he is my dear cousin, and I spent a lot of time at their house growing up. And so even hearing hearing how gently he's describing <laughs> <laughs> the order that his mother and father required is really kind of funny because it was like uh, you walked in the house, you started your chores, you knew that if there was like I knew the routine and I wasn't part of the routine. So it's kind of funny how he's like, well, I, when I was four and I'm like, no, really, you were four. And you were probably four in the laundry <laughs> basket. That's a real thing. That's a real thing. And with saying that, uh, I always hated, hated, hated doing dishes. Um, and it, Felt like it was always my kitchen, you know? Um, and so today, now that I have a cleaning company, that's something we do not do is dishes. <laughs> because, and I know that. <laughs> I, I don't want to be part of dishes. <laughs> um, but I think what inspired me really was I, I had a relative that was staying with me and um, just over the weekend, and it was a really, really crazy, hectic weekend. Um, and so I'm kind of in and out, literally. Um, and sorry about my dog barking. Um, but I'm literally like in and out of there. And when I came home from church Sunday morning, my house was so clean. And when I walked in and I smelled it and I saw it, I was like, oh, oh my God. And you know, she left a note and was like, thank you so much for, you know, allowing me to crash here this weekend. I know you had, you know, uh, pretty busy weekend, but I appreciate you and all I, you know, the least I could do was clean up for you. I know you're busy. I, when I tell you the feeling that I had that, that came over me, just walking into a house where I didn't have to clean up, that was my, I, you know, I knew I was going to have to clean up, you know, when I got home and got settled. So to, to, to feel that, I was like, oh, people have to experience this. So having having experienced that joy, I will tell you, I, I'm glad you were inspired. I don't know. I know this is probably driving you crazy, the dog. So I don't know if you want to step away or not, or if it's just going to be fine there. Either way, whatever works for you. I just want you to know if you can do okay. whatever you want. But um, I will transition to you, Gana. If you could tell us a little bit about your um, kind of your journey to entrepreneurship, why you decided to. Um, start your business and how you got started. That would be great. Um, thank you for having me first. Um, so it wasn't really a f my first love cooking, really. I didn't cook the last, how many, 25 years until we did the farmer's market. Um, so I grew up in Ethiopia and I came to America in 1985 and I have different kind of jobs. Uh, but we cook at home with my siblings, but I, we never thought we I will be the best cook or owning a restaurant. So um, what what start with, uh, before I got there, I married my husband in 1994. He was a soldier. We stationed a lot of places. We visit a lot of places. So our last assignment was Seoul, Korea. So after eight years service, he retired and we moved back here, Davenport, since he's from here. So, um, as you know, there is no lot of diversity. They never know Ethiopian. They never know anything about the food or the culture. So when we have a potluck, I always cook whatever uh, easier for me or easier. I thought they will eat it. So I do. I take like potato or meat or something. I didn't take color green. I didn't take beets. I didn't take lentils or anything. But I took some of the simplest things to introduce them while I grow up eating. But they know I don't cook at home. I don't even go grocery store. My husband does everything at home. I clean though. <laughs> <laughs> but, but do you do dishes? I do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, so that's what I mean. It's really nobody believes me. I say I'm gonna have a restaurant. So it was it was really um, it, it, everybody was surprised to tell you the truth. Then uh, my two friends, uh, they're not with me right now. I mean, with the business, but uh, we decided to open a restaurant. We don't have any clue, but the, somebody mentioned, yeah, you have to go to a small business office. 
then we went to Mr. Joel Young. Uh, he said um, he stayed us like 10 minutes. So what are you doing? I mean, we say we're going to open a restaurant. We don't have any clue about business plan or the logistic part. I mean, he was just there us in 30 minutes. So he gave us a lot of lectures in the meantime. In lot of, we learned a lot of things from him because that's what he do 24 hours. So he told us to go to the farmer's market. So we went to the farmer's market and see our business. So that's the way we start because of the potlucks we did, uh, the people accepted and the people they know I'm from Ethiopia. They say, oh, I had that food in Virginia. I had that food in Chicago. I have that food, Los Angeles, but there is nothing in Iowa. So that's what I say, even though I don't have any plan, all of us married, husband and family. So we really don't have any time for restaurant, but we want to do it. Really, we, that's it. I mean, it was really, um, when I think about it, I'm still like saying, wow, what did I do to myself? <laughs> <laughs> so we did, I mean, help with uh, my husband, really 100%. He support me. Uh, I mean, he doesn't have a choice. I mean, still married to me till now. <laughs> uh, so he really helped us a lot, a lot, really 100%. Really, if he went for him, we wouldn't be here. Yeah. yeah. So, but um, the first Saturday, May 1st, 2016, I mean, uh, people would run away from us. What, what, what happened? We have music, we have the taint, we have the food, the smell. People know about the food, they run to us. The others run from us. So we plan a sample to try the food. Mm -hmm. Then we introduce them like weekly. It wasn't about the money. So, but we just want to introduce the food. Do, do they like it? Like, it's like a focus group really, but we're selling mm -hmm. food. So that's what the small business, uh, Mr. Young want us to do. So we did that for three years, 2016. Mm -hmm. They left me, they left my partner in 2017. So my husband and I, we took the business 2017 and 2018 at the farmer's market. Then the, the commercial kitchen was closed to be a restaurant. Currently, it's now the diner. So I don't have anywhere else to cook. So we start okay. looking for a place. In the meantime, I, I have full-time job at the Arsenal, and my husband works too. And I have a son uh, in college, so really I have to, I can't leave my job. I have to support him. So then we start looking a place, and uh, we found next door. I have the same landlord. So the the process was very long because leasing uh, the building from the city. Mm -hmm. So so it took like six months. Wow. In the middle of the construction, we have that flood. I mean, we spend a lot of money. Imagine um, we we went through a lot of things. I mean, mm -hmm. but we decided to open the business in July 2019 next door of the farmers market or the union station. That's where we are right now. <laughs> So I, I think there's something really interesting to, and, and Larry, you didn't touch on this, but I kind of know that you use some of the services in the community as well as part of your business strategy development. And so um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. But before before we do that, Gannett, I do have to let you know your reputation precedes you. I know you said I wasn't, you know, everybody didn't think I would have a restaurant, but I yeah. heard about this lady at the arsenal Yes. Who makes Ethiopian food before yes. I ever knew there was a restaurant. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's amazing. And, and so I share that as because um, you know, I really do feel like when um, you know, regardless of what your spiritual or religious affiliation is, when when there's a higher calling, mm -hmm. doors will open for you. Mm -hmm. Right. And I do mm -hmm. think that if you have a talent or a skill yeah. and when the timing is right. You know, in a lot of ways, you can be quite unstoppable, even if it's not something that was on your radar. It's like these doors, they just continue to open. Yeah. And I even found that with Iman, like I wasn't ready to launch. I was really resistant to even beginning it because I was like, do I want to talk about DEI all the time, diversity, equity, and inclusion all the time? Mm -hmm. Um but it, there's there's a need, right? And you find this void, and then you you step into that void and, and fill and help people fill it. So mm -hmm. I just want you both to know, like even in hearing your story, Larry, about how you grew up with this order and structure, and how you've carried mm -hmm. that into your profession, um, 
it, it really, hopefully there's someone who's listening, who is thinking about something or considering something and hopefully they can be inspired by that because so often I think, um, especially as we're looking at the black entrepreneur experience, you feel like you have to have this automatic skill set or maybe you have family members or a parent who's run it and you have you feel like I don't have a degree like you think of all these obstacles of why you can't do it mm -hmm. and so hopefully you've inspired someone who just has this natural talent or this urge that maybe they're not stepping into because they feel like it's a lonely space to be in so I just wanted to put that out there but the other thing is you mentioned Joel Young's uh with this yes. development yes. Yes. Center, I think is what it's called. Yes. And Larry, you've talked to me about score before. Yes. yes. Score too. Yes. So did you guys I, both use those? Yes. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Larry, Larry, tell me a little bit. Did you use uh, the small business development center as well, or did you just use score? I, I did. Um, I used, I went to score first and um, strangely enough, it was not for fresh start at all. <laughs> I was, <laughs> I was going because I was starting another business um, and, you know, Fresh Start was kind of, you know, just rolling, you know, and um, but where I really wanted to be was somewhere else. So I was working on that. I'm, you know, mm -hmm. Fresh Start is just kind of doing what it's doing. And I was, you know, heavy on this other project. And so I went to SCORE and they gave me all of this paperwork and I was like, OK. <laughs> You know, it's a lot to just go through, and uh, yeah. but but they were very very insightful um, and very very helpful, and so then they pointed me also to um, the small business development center, and I met with <laughs> it was on the Illinois side because the business that I was going to open was going to be on the Illinois side, um, as opposed to my Iowa um, Fresh Start company. So um, I met with Ann, and I'm talking to her about this company and. And I ended up mentioning Fresh Start. She's like, whoa, what are you doing? And I love Anne because Joel too. I, I had an opportunity yeah. to talk to Joel too. Yeah. Joel, Joel chewed me out. <laughs> <laughs> when I left there, I thought, I know. I over there again? <laughs> he just talked me out of my dreams here. Yes. <laughs> but what they both ended up doing yeah. was setting me on the right track. You have a business right now. Yeah. You know, why are you just, if it's not making you millions, if it's not at your goal, then sit down somewhere. <laughs> and I appreciate it because the people, you know, other people that I, that I was talking to, you know, they're gung ho about it. Yes. Yeah. I'll help you do it. I'll help you do it. And it doesn't really work like that. So I was grateful. Great. And I'm still very, very grateful to Ann and both Joel. I didn't spend a lot of time with Joel. I spent a lot of time with Ann. And they really just helped me hone in on Fresh Start, uh, with Fresh Start. And that's why Fresh Start is where we're at today. So, yeah. I mean, I think another uh, example of that is, you know, even as you're trying to build a business to go into a different avenue or a different um, line of business, then a pandemic happens. and. Yes. I can't imagine that people didn't need commercial cleaning mm -hmm. assistance. After. I mean, I know what we went through. And so I, it, you know, sometimes you have your own plan, but it's like, mm -hmm. if you just follow, you know, if you just follow, even though it doesn't feel like it feels like you're working against whatever your own plan is, it, it really mm -hmm. can work out if things are meant to be. And I imagine um, having a restaurant during the pandemic, um, and I mean, you even mentioned the flood, just even being yes. so many businesses that didn't sustain that, yes. sustain past that. Can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, how you were able to operate um, and keep your business running during the pandemic? And then I also want to talk to you guys about the, the PPP loans, if that's something that was applicable to you. Okay. So, good night. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, so we were in the middle of the construction. In fact, we got the key. Uh, then uh, we start on what we need and we line up what comes first, what we need to do for the building. So the building was vacant for three years. So we have to scratch from, you know, zero. So, so what we are doing, then the flip 
same and everything has to be stopped. I mean, because when contractors, they schedule what they need to do. So when the flood comes, it wasn't their priority. So we have to wait. So in the meantime, we're spending money, we're spending time. So we plan to open it in May uh, 2019, but it hold us three months, but uh, we couldn't even go to the building. So the, one of the the guy who did the tile for us he had a, a canoe so he used to wear his uh, fishing gear to come to the building it, it was very sad i was like i was very hurt at that time but once we open it's different story because everybody was waiting for the restaurant so we did i mean the best time we have was that year up to covid comes so until the day the governor say shut the restaurant, we were doing a good business. So then uh, when COVID comes, so we have to let go la, our employees. We were, we didn't have a lot of employees. We have kids who do the dishes and we have two people in the kitchen. And I work at the arsenal 10 hours a day, so four days a week. So then I cook Friday and I cook after work. And my day off was when we close Monday, I come in after work and cook. So my husband take care of the logistic up front and I cook. And uh, we did a uh, lot of carry out. Uh, and uh, the customers, they came and support us. So we didn't close. We, we didn't close until we took vacation. So we were lucky. So I'm glad. I'm glad that the community rallied around not only your businesses, your business, but also um, other businesses, particularly in our downtown areas. Mm -hmm. um, as, as many of the people listening know, in April of 2020, the Paycheck Protection Program um, began mm -hmm. and was available to businesses that were struggling to make ends meet during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, doing a little research on it, it, the data shows that minority owned businesses were among the last to receive resources. Um, this was due in part to the loan applications either being rejected by banks or banks simply just not even responding to applicants, but there was some disproportionality in how those funds were allocated. Did either of you or your businesses uh, go through the PPP uh, application process and um, were, the, were those resources truly available uh, to minority owned businesses? For me, for us, yeah, even though we didn't get much because when we opened the business, it wasn't even a year old. Even though we have a food stand at the farmer's market for three years, they didn't count that. So we did. We got the money, what we supposed to, according our, we didn't even have a tax return for 2019, you know, when it happens. So, so we didn't file at that time, but we got, the process was everything is okay so we got the help but we never grant in we didn't get any grants from um, anybody else we just got the ppp did you apply for grants we did okay okay they reject us because we didn't open march 2019 since we opened in july 2019 okay it wasn't we couldn't qualify but we never exist in their book at that time at the restaurant how about you larry with fresh start so we did not um, take advantage of the PPP, um, but we did. We were able to take advantage of the grants that were out there. Is there and a particular? We also go ahead. Was there a particular reason why you didn't uh, use the, you know attempt for the PPP, or was it not on your radar, or did it seem not well, attainable? I'm trying to get a sense of yeah, it, it wasn't necessarily on the radar, and all at the same time we were um, at the time that you know, the businesses were shutting down, closing down. Um, we were, of course, losing clients. And I think I was I, I was actually at your house when um, I got a phone call, you know, from, from the one of my last large clients um, that they were closing and, you know, they literally don't have to come in even that night. And so um, I ended up getting a call about an hour later from, the railroad and they were looking for somebody to start like immediately because they had lost their cleaner it had hadn't it wasn't about COVID or anything and so they're essential workers so that made us essential workers so we were able to you know sustain and it was a larger contract than what we had lost so um, it actually just kind of flipped for us so that was 
we didn't thankfully we didn't necessarily have to take advantage of um, the PPP. Okay. Okay. Well, that's that's helpful, especially when we're trying to give people at the local level an understanding of what some people's experiences were. And so I'm glad that in our community, maybe at least reflecting on this conversation hasn't been um, indicative of what was happening or correlated to what was happening at maybe the national level. So I know Fresh Start, you, you all do some business outside of the Quad City area. Um, Gannett, do you guys have another restaurant anywhere else? Or are you no. based over here? Oh, she's like, no, I am here. One, I just told you I'm at the Arsenal. I'm in, I'm in the demand. I'm in to tell you that the demand. I have a lot of requests because my customers drive, uh, drove wherever. But it's like an hour. I have like Peoria, Iowa City, uh, Galesburg, Dixon. I mean, one hour, an hour and a half, two hours to drive to to come and eat the food. So are you, Larry, you, I don't think you've been there. Have I you, have. Been, you have? I Isn't have. it? It's like, it's like a whole. I loved it. Experience. That was my first time ever. Really? It is. Oh my God. That was okay. my first time ever. I was like, okay. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> I can do this. <laughs> well, it is a cultural experience too, yeah. because like they, yeah. you know, they, you don't have to have your utensils. You're eating mm -hmm. with your hands and um, yep. it just, it, it really is a, unique uh it's a unique opportunity here in the quad city so are you all is you are you um in terms of proximity to other ethiopian restaurants how um how close is the next one chicago there was one in iowa city but it closed i don't know why they closed in a year so there was one in area iowa city area yes in chicago the next one Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Larry, you all do business. Fresh Start does business outside of the Quad City. So I wanted to see from your perspective, um, having operated in other spaces, what makes the Quad Cities a unique, um, a unique place to do business, specifically as it relates to you know being a black business owner. Well, I, you know, the Quad Cities is home. First of all, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's. It, it's home and I've, I have traveled a lot of places um, and to this day, I, I want to move away, <laughs> but <laughs> but even when I go other places, I'm there, I want to come home, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to the Quad Cities <laughs> where things are just regular. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the Quad Cities, I, I hadn't had the opportunity I, I was working for john deere um for about 10 years and so i hadn't had the opportunity to know or even notice small businesses on the level that i do now and how much support mm -hmm. the quad cities gives to local small businesses um and so i, I mean even for for me as a black owned business um you don't I, for me, I, I just didn't know, you know, how, how good we have it <laughs> here in this area, you know, because it's, um, we have, for like, like you said, Fresh Start, we have Fresh Start in other areas, um, some rural areas, and I mean rural areas. Um, how we got out there, I don't really know, but um, the Quad Cities is very unique in the, in the sense that there's so many ethnicities here. There's, you know, I mean, and so it's, you're going to run into your race issues everywhere you go. However, um, we don't have, we don't, I personally, let me just speak for myself. I have not had to deal with a lot of that. Um, and you just don't find that, you know, in your smaller towns. So to me, that's what makes the Quad Cities unique as it relates to our business. So when you say you don't find that in your smaller towns, you, tell me what you mean more specifically. When you you don't find the racism or you don't find any issues related to race or that you would attribute to race in small towns or specifically are you talking about like the Quad Cities as a small town? Um, the Quad Cities as a small town. Um, because when you go to for real small towns, this is small, but you know, there are <laughs> small towns for real. <laughs> <laughs> And so when when we go to these other places, you know, um, as a black man, 
I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm that guy. I will speak to everybody. If, you know, if you're walking in my path or if I can see you and we make eye, to eye contact, I'm going to speak to you. And so some of the areas that we have business in, um, they don't know that the owner is a black man. And um, so I have, I visit those places, but the response is a little different. Their hello is a little, eh, okay. You know, um, so, but here, and it's not because everybody knows me. I have a, we have a popular name, but there's so many new people in this area now um, that the name is kind of irrelevant. Um, but the response is, you don't, we just don't have, we, I don't get that. I don't get those types of closed off responses uh, here in the Quad Cities as I do in other places. Good, good. Now, We've talked a little bit about, um, you know, stepping into how you became to be a business owner. We've talked a little bit about how you've survived through <laughs> COVID. Um, the reality of it, though, is when you look at some of the statistics, um, there's an organization called USA Facts, and they look at uh, basically they're an organization that takes public like government data, synthesizes it and puts it out in a way that's more user friendly. But only about two, two, just over two percent of the nation's over five and a half million employer businesses are black owned. Black owned. So, really, just right at two percent of businesses are small businesses anyway are owned by black folks. So, in a lot of ways, you are unique um, in your ownership, right? And the fact that you have a, an employer business. What I want to find out from you is why do you think that there aren't more black owned businesses that would be proportionate to maybe the overall population of black people, um, either locally or even at a, a broader level? What is preventing black businesses from either being started or or growing? Can that, I'll maybe start with you on that. Sure. Um, I think. Of course, it's going to be, first thing, it's going to be finance, really. And um, so first, you have to know you want to do the business. So even though I told you earlier, I don't have any the logistic or what I'm going to do, but I have something inside me. I know for sure I can do it. So and I can ask, I can learn, I, I can get mentor. You, you can do that. So So the process is very long, the commitment. Uh, um, and especially in America, I didn't know if you have a good, um, uh, what do you call it, um, the financial history, some money wise. And do we really, I mean, when I grow up, I didn't learn about the money. I mean, there is no saving. If I want to buy a purse, I have to take the money. There is no credit card. I don't really need to know my credit score. Mm -hmm. I really nobody measure me for how much money I have in a, you know, in the bank. But here in America, you have to learn because that's a story, that's, that's culture. And um, so you really, you have to know what, if you really believe you can have the business, it shouldn't stop you anything unless scared of the bank or you don't have money or, it, I mean, you have to start from yourself. That's what I did. I have to know what I can do before I go to the bank, before uh, I, I create the business, like I go to the small business and I say, I want to open the restaurant. You know, I don't think the bank will give me money, you know, because I, I even though I work and I have a good credit score, it's, it's not important. I can open the restaurant. So what do you do after that? So you have to know, you have to learn, you have educated yourself and you have to get mentor about the restaurant or a business. Uh, or uh, at the workplace, you can ask anybody. They will guide you, really. There is information. So I'm not really sure if, of course, 100% is finance, uh, but the other thing, it's up to the person. That's yeah. what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. Right. So I hear you saying that finances may be an obstacle if you didn't grow yes. up in an environment. Because yes. I can tell you right now, Gannett, there's, there's many homes where the conversations about finance aren't happening. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you come from a background where there were people that were in poverty or you come from a background where maybe finance 
um, re those financial resources aren't there, right? Yeah. Um, so you have this fear. I hear you say maybe fear of how to approach that or this deficit mindset that says, oh, I don't have the resources to even begin to get started. Um, but I also hear you saying that you can ask the questions to help. Yes. Get, you have to be willing to take that step to be vulnerable, to ask those questions. Um, I saw that there was one comment that that came in um, from the Facebook feeds at, from uh, Yamale uh, Jean Simon, and she was talking to, as you, as you all were talking, she was talking about how you have a really inspirational story. And so, part of why I shared at the beginning the comments around these Black Wall Streets, and a lot of times people attribute them to just one place, like Tulsa had a Black Wall Street. There were Black Wall Streets all across America, and so this notion. Um, and having you, Gannett, and having you, Larry, people who have access self-determination, mm -hmm. who have said, despite some of the statistics and how they may stack up against me, despite that I know that there's some discrimination, there are, this is factual, right? And people maybe don't know the, all the data, but they know their experience or they know the experience of their neighbor. There are discriminatory practices in lending, right? If I go to a bank as a <laughs> black person, I may have, a, there's a, a strong possibility that I yeah. may have a different, different experience than some of my counterparts. That's just the reality in the numbers. Okay. Yeah. If you put all of that to the side and you say, I'm still going to go after it because I want it. Yes. And you decide I am going to have dominion over this experience, whether I end up being successful or whether I fail, it's accessing that self-determination and the same <laughs> I'm going to be vulnerable and ask the questions that I don't know the answers to. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take the time and learn the things that I need to learn to stay afloat or, and I'm going to find a mentor to come alongside me and guide me. Yes. It's kind of what I hear you saying. Yes. It's very true because uh, I mean, I really don't even speak the language. And when sometimes before you sign, I say, I ask my husband, what is this? Because I want to make sure I understand what I'm signing. So the process, even when we start at the farmer's market, the process is as if you're opening the restaurant, the health department, you have to have the accountant, you have to have the lawyer. I mean, the process is, I mean, you, 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 I mean, you can give up easily the logistics side. Then you open in managing. So I work 17, 16 hours a day because, because I'm committed. And when I cook at the restaurant, there is nothing I open a can. I chop everything. I cut everything. I mean, we cook everything. And I clean the house. I clean the bathroom because it's my business. I have to do that. I don't have to expect anything. So my husband does the same thing. He washes the dishes. He serves. I mean, he can cook to the food. He didn't even grow up eating it. So what I mean is you need a support. You need a friend. You can dial them as 911. I have a lot of friends. I need help. Come and wash dishes. Come and cook. So, so we need the support. So... That's why we are here because um, I want to do it and I need help. So, and I can be there for you too if you need me. So I don't think you can do anything by yourself. That's why we need this community. And as Larry said, this is a perfect place to live in Davenport. When uh, when I go to Virginia, I want to come back because all my family is over there. It's, it's just me here and with my husband family. So, and I have a lot of friends. And there is a lot of professional Ethiopians, so they will come and support you. And nobody knows where Ethiopia exists, so I put them up in the restaurant. So I'm teaching the same thing. I teach how you eat. Nobody knows what lentil looks like. So, I mean, um, it's like a school. I mean, sometimes a cooking school. Um, so what I mean is when you love something, you have to really do it 100%. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I'm saying. And I've said to people even today in a meeting um, or maybe it was yesterday, we can do hard things. And, mm -hmm. you know, you guys are on the other side of maybe and not to say that it's not difficult, but that startup piece yes. can be a big obstacle for people. Um, I just want to one more time, um, you know, recognize um, Yamale and her comments. She was inspired by your story, but she mm -hmm. has been very helpful to me and has inspired me and has been that person that I could lean on. Um, as I was, you know, approaching getting started up, 
she was definitely that uh, mentor or that person I could be vulnerable with and say, I don't know how to approach this. I don't know what contract should look like. But I will say for me, I found comfort in being able to identify um, with with another black woman. Um, I had another really strong mentor in um, Ted Stevens and um, you know, equally as connected as I was to Yamale, but I do think that representation um, matters and I, I leaned on Yamale in a different way than I did with Ted, mm -hmm. um, both on just from a gender perspective and a race perspective, but like they, in skill sets, quite frankly, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah. I think that your point that you can't do it alone. Yes. No one should be expecting to try and start a business totally alone. And you, you need to know that you need other people. And so... Uh, building those bridges and making those connections, whether they're with people who look like you or not, just being vulnerable mm -hmm. enough to, to put yourself out there and, and say what your goals and priorities are. I want to just take just a minute um, to, and shift gears just a little bit. Uh, Larry, I think you might be able to speak to this. There's... Um, there's there's the federal the federal government has laws and mandates around the contracts that they issue. And the reason I want to bring this up is because, again, there may be people who are listening, um, who who are wanting to start something, don't know where to begin. Um, so I think hopefully this is a tidbit that would be helpful to someone like that. Um, but the federal law, federal government has mandates on about 23 percent of their federal contracts have to be t allocated to small businesses. And of that. Um, five percent are meant for businesses uh, that are run by owners who come from an economically or socially disadvantaged background. Um, so minority owned businesses, um, women run businesses would qualify for that as well. Um, do you have any experience with securing federal contracts or um, securing federal funding as it relates to this? And can you talk to us a little bit about what that process was like? So <clears throat> we um, we did take advantage of the now I can say we because uh, we took advantage of when we started the business, we wanted to fall in those categories of um, uh, minority owned, woman owned. And so my best friend, who is my partner, um, uh, she, she we did 5149 so that it could be woman owned. Um, on paper, and so we could qualify for some of these uh, benefits, really, um, with the government contracts and things like that. So um, we have not taken advantage of the um, funding, um, but because of our station, we were able to um, we're, we're able to get a lot of information on the contracts that are not just here. In the Quad Cities, um, but they're like they're nationwide, and I only chose nationwide because I'm not ready for worldwide yet. Um, <laughs> but they do, and, and we're we're linked up with the Arsenal as well. Um, we do a lot of their their move outs, and um, we actually just put in uh, a bid for a contract out there, and uh, it's it's a great great thing because we're on this whole list because of our. Um, our status, the, you know, the woman owned, um, minority owned, you know, those things. It's um, so it, it has afforded us a broad scope of work um, that we have not fully taken advantage of because there's so much happening all at one time right here in the Quad Cities. Um, but we, we know that the, the possibilities are endless. And so for anyone that is listening that um, has a business, or even if you don't have a business, minority, woman-owned, that is the way to go. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and, and it's really not that hard of a process. They have people in place that will walk you through every single step of that. Um, I, I've had the, the opportunity and the pleasure to meet um, a few people along the way that um, got us set up, you know, cage numbers. I mean, just all kinds of stuff. There's so much support and so much um, help out there for these government contracts. Uh, it, it would just be silly, really, not to take advantage of them. Okay. And I think people need to know that because, like you said, some of these processes, uh, the not knowing 
the the unknown can be more intimidating than just actually taking the step yep. and and trying it out and yep. failing forward. You know, I'd rather see people go after something um, and approach it and maybe not be successful than to not have tried at all. And I think the other thing is if there are people who who are running businesses, regardless of their race or ethnicity, um, knowing that you, if you're in a position where you can bring somebody along, somebody that shows promise, somebody that has an aspiration, maybe it's one of your employees who really you can see it, that they have something in them. They're going to be the person that's like Gannett, who's going to work the, the 16 hour days and, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. And hire them to have their own because really this conversation is not just about how do you run a business? How do you get a business? It's about how do you help people access self-determination, especially if they've been part of a cycle um, where basic needs are not met. Yeah. Um, if you're worried about how to pay bills or if you're worried about how to get to food or if you're worried about just trying to make ends meet, sometimes you're, you're so caught up in the immediacy of now that you can't think four or five years down the road. That was, and, and, and you, you had asked about, you know, what stops um, really black people from starting their own businesses and things like that. And I, I think it's because, first of all, fear, you know, yeah. fear of the unknown. Um, I had no business experience for real, for real. You know what I mean? I have friends and family that own businesses and things like that, but to be in it, I had, I had never been in it like that. And so um, it was definitely the unknown. I quit John Deere to do this, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that was a huge step. It was definitely the unknown. Um, I knew right off the bat, I was not gonna be able to make the money. <laughs> 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 and, you know, and I, I truth, truthfully, I lost a couple things, but not, not, anything like you would, I, I wasn't out, you know what I mean? I wasn't homeless or anything like that, but um, I just lost the luxuries that I had, right? But that was the sacrifice. And you really don't have the greatest of things without sacrifice somewhere. And sacrifice really, you know, starts with the unknown, you know, and you know, there's so much help out there. And that's really what I want people to know there's so much help out there that it, it can really be easy to start the business. Now, maintaining it is a different story, yeah. <laughs> but it can be easy to start it. And, and if you can just open up your mind to think further than um, constantly working for somebody unhappy, okay? Really, you know, and, and if you have something, you know you've got something, you have to just yeah. kind of step out and look for those resources because there's so many out here. So what I do want to do um, is I want to make sure that we go back. Um, I can tell the people who are listening now, we'll go back into the chat and put some of the resources out after this. Uh, when this is done, be live, I'll find time probably even tomorrow or even later on tonight to go back into the chat and add some of those resources that you all have referenced. Um, and also, you know, just so that people know where they can go to be able to um if they're in, if they're if they're looking for a little bit of a a nugget on to help them get started where they could maybe go so i i do want to ask one question um before we kind of wrap things up and this question i wouldn't say it's controversial but i do think it gets at the heart of kind of this uh polarizing views as it relates to some of the dialogue around supporting uh, black owned businesses and I want to get your perspective. Um, there are we are obviously still in a pandemic. There are many businesses and small businesses that are struggling to just stay afloat. Um, we have seen a tremendous amount of um, energy um, and resources um, and time being dedicated to people who are saying things like, you know, we need to support Black-owned businesses and that type of thing. Uh, what do you say to the person who says, I could never support a white owned business? I could never say we need to support white owned businesses. Um, but yet we do say we need to support black owned businesses. Um, our calls for support to support, excuse me, our calls for support for black owned businesses, appropriate, fair or equi equitable from your perspective. 
Larry, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I really, I really, that's a kind of a catch 22 question. Um, but mm -hmm. I, 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 my perspective on it is, first of all, if it's small business, regardless of the race, it, it needs to be put. Um, because a lot of these small businesses are, and, and in my opinion, when it comes to um, someone who, who you, you said someone that is pushing, supporting white-owned business? Well, the narrative is, I can't say support white-owned businesses. Why am I able to, why are people able to say support black-owned businesses? Why are we giving so much attention or focus on that? um right now and is that even appropriate i guess is what i'm what i'm asking okay all right and so i, I do think that it's appropriate um, um be, because there's been a there's been a name that um whether people know it or not it, it wasn't you mentioned it earlier about the history of black wall street okay where did that go who brought that down you know, so that those are things that definitely need to be pushed. The white owned businesses have, and I'm not meaning this for everyone, but has always thrived in the eyes of a black owned business. They've always thrived. So pushing, even along with the whole Black Lives Matter thing, that whole thing, um, the black owned businesses mainly or minority owned businesses because it's time for the the minority businesses to rise that that is that's that's where i stand with that and mm -hmm. of course i'm i'm pro business i'm pro small business i'm pro entrepreneur um <laughs> but when it comes to the minority side of things the businesses it is time to show the strength and it absolutely has to be pushed from all sides. Okay, okay. How about you, Gannett? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, um, at first, I mean, uh, before the restaurant, uh, my husband and my, his sisters, we used to go every Saturday, every restaurant, I mean, the Quad City area, everywhere. But until uh, Black Lives Matter, when they say who own Black business, that's the first time I even noticed so how many in this area uh, and who owns them and uh, what's going on in their life. So, I mean, I'm bad. I didn't think that way because I thought every business do the same thing because I know I'm going there. I never ask who is the owner really. You go, oh, I love the food. I want to go there. Where do I go that Saturday? So it's, it's going to be hard for me as a business owner, just come to my restaurant or support this and that. We shouldn't be, I mean, we should talk about it. But when we say February is a black restaurant, um, you know, in uh, the black, um, uh, you know, African-American month. So you should go to a black restaurant in February or you have to support the black restaurant or business. It might be hard sometimes to say it because I know how hard they try to get there. Even though they, I mean, we can't change some of the things that happens, but we it's it's a good thing i learn from it i learn who they are what they need has to be done but I, i'm not sure you know i'm not there to say just come to my restaurant don't go the next door so right. i right. say support everybody because i've been i walk that shoes even though they're rich or they're white they did the same thing the process is the same thing how they start maybe they're successful you know so, but this is a perfect time. I say, here I am. Right, right. The restaurant, this is me. I have a good food. Come and eat. I'm introduced you for something new. So I have to work hard on myself too, to, to, you know, push what I have and promote. Right, right. So if it makes sense. <laughs> no, I definitely, I definitely understand where you're coming from. And I, I asked the question because it can be a little bit of a touchy subject. And I think yeah. it's important that we do in these hidden conversations, touch yeah. on some of these things. 
from my perspective, by supporting a minority owned business, we're not implying that you don't support yes. a non minority owned business. I think there are historical reasons why we should be uplifting minority owned businesses, but I also know that there are uh, wealth gaps in our community. Mm -hmm. And if we address the needs of those, it's no different than if a house were on fire. If, I, if I'm in a neighborhood and there's a house on, my house is in the middle, there's a house on the left and a house on the right. If my house in the middle is on fire, I don't necessarily, I'm not gonna be upset because you put uh, water on my house. If you're putting the resources on my house that needs the fire put out. If you put water on the left side, house and the right side house, what for? Their house isn't on fire. Mm -hmm. We know there are wealth gaps in our communities. Mm -hmm. And by instilling an entrepreneurial spirit, we elevate the overall prosperity of our communities when we look at those communities that maybe um, in some regards have less than. So I don't think it's about saying don't go to, yeah, don't go to a, um, a a white business or a non-minority business. I don't think the message is that. And I think that sometimes people feel like that's what we're saying. Also, when you look at the proportionality and you look at how many minority owned or black owned businesses there are, by saying support small business, in effect, you are saying support white business because most of them yeah. are. <laughs> yeah. So the, the yeah. white is almost like implied, right? And so I think um, why I shared the example of Black Wall Street at the beginning is because I want people to have a better understanding of the historical context. If we are not intentional about creating connections, if I know that I'm going to go support my friend's business and most of my friends look like me, I'm probably only going to go to businesses that, uh, without even me thinking about it, that are run by people that look like me. If we want our overall economy to grow, if I'm a business owner and my business does well, I'm going to spend more money in our community. My kids are going to be able to spend more money in the community and they may have fin a financial legacy that I am able to leave them with, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about elevating, to me, it's about elevating those who have been situated historically and, and, and in some instances, even at the local context, Larry, because not everybody's going to have the same success story or haven't been embraced in the same way that maybe you have, right? If we know that we are able to put the water where the fire is to make sure everybody's okay, to make sure the whole community does better. So I, I get where people come from, but I, I thought it was an important conversation to have. My biggest takeaways from tonight um, and I'm so grateful that you guys made time to, to I know you work long days <laughs> I'm off long today. Nights <laughs> and, and all that. Um, yeah. And I know you've got the candle uh, burning on both ends. And so I, I, my biggest takeaway and what I hope that people hear from this is that that drive, yes. that self-determination, mm -hmm. that willingness to sacrifice to know that you're gonna be vulnerable and it's not gonna be easy, to know that there's mentorship, there are resources uh, available in this community, but also to know that there are successful black businesses out there and there are other businesses that are maybe not as well known that are black owned businesses. And intentionality from my perspective is really important about how we, uh, we decide to approach mm -hmm. elevating the community as a whole. So with that, I want to thank you, Larry, from Fresh Start. I'm trying to get one more last <laughs> plug in, right? <laughs> and Gwinnett from Taste of Ethiopia, the only Ethiopian restaurant for yes. a two-hour radius, right? Yeah. So, um, check her out in downtown Davenport. Larry, I know you do commercial as well as uh, residential services, and I'm lucky to be part of that 10% of your residential services as opposed to the 90% of commercial right. that you do. Um, you guys are both fantastic. Your food is amazing. Your services are great. You guys are outstanding professionals. And I'm so glad that you've given up your time and talent tonight to our Hidden Conversations. Until next month, I want to thank my audience for tuning in and we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Thank you for joining us this evening for Hidden Conversations. 
The Hidden Conversations Project is coordinated by Dr. Ladrina Wilson, Tracy Singleton, Dr. Lauren Hammond Ford, Ryan Sadler, and me, Jared Johnson. We would also like to thank everyone on the Intelligent Conversations Planning Committee and WVIK's Community Advisory Board for their support and guidance. Support for Hidden Conversations comes from a Healing Illinois grant from the Chicago Community Trust and from a United for Equity grant from United Way Quad Cities.